All right, boys and girls, welcome back. This video will continue the mini series on Skull 3, and in this video, I'm going to talk about opaque types. So, this video will assume that you know some of the Skull fundamentals, and in particular, Skull 2, because at the moment of this recording, Skull 3 hasn't even been released yet, and this also assumes that you have a recent uh, IDE that will support. Dottie, which is the code name for what will become Skull 3. In this video and in the rest of the videos on Skull 3, I'm using IntelliJ version 2020.2, and I'm also going to show you how you can create a Skull 3 project. Now, as always, I'll recommend that you code with me in this video, and whenever you need to refresh your memory on these topics, just return to this video or to its written form with the link in the description. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Rock the JVM channel because more content like this is coming. All right, so without further ado, let's get to our code editor. So I've created a small object here, which will also add a main method in case we need to test anything. And this works on a, a pre-release version of Scala 3. So if you're using IntelliJ IDEA, I'm using the Community Edition 2020.2, which also has experimental support for Dottie, the code name for what will become Scala 3. So if you want to create a Scala 3 project, you would go to file new project and then if you have the Scala plugin installed you will have the option here to pick Scala on the left hand side and after that you can click Dotty experimental on the right hand side and after you click next the wizard is already familiar so you can name your project however you like and you can um, put it wherever you want on your file system and that will be it so you will have a project with Scala 3 support. Now, what's the motivation with these new opaque types concept? So um, it's often the case that we define new types as wrappers over existing types. So via composition, we define uh, new types as wrapping doubles or strings or multiple doubles and so on and so forth. However, in many cases, this mechanism will involve at least some sort of overhead um, while accessing fields or methods or things along those lines. So let's take an example. Let's say we're working on a social network and one of the fundamental pieces of data is a user detail. But uh, we want to enforce some rules so that the user's details are correct. So for instance, we may want to force their names to start with a capital letter. Now this may not be appropriate in all the languages, but let's just assume this scenario for the sake of this example. So I'm going to define a case class called name, which wraps a value called string. All right, so the value is of type string. And inside this case class, you may want to put some additional logic here. Now, this particular case is a plain wrapper over a string. Now, of course, we can also use things like refined types uh, to enforce logic imposed on some particular types. And we have a video on refined types on the Rock the JVM channel, which I recommend you check out. But regardless of what we end up choosing, this new name type will incur some sort of overhead. And if we have millions or billions of users, these tiny little overheads will start to add up. So um, an example of overhead is to access the inner value inside or to run an additional method that will call uh, a, a method on the class string. All right. So um, enter opaque types. Now a name is basically just a string name should be a string, not wrap a string, and with some additional logic. But due to this extra logic that we attach to it, we have no choice but to incur this overhead either by wrapping it or by forcing the compiler to run some extra checks at compile time. Now, opaque types allow us to define name as being a string, it allows us to attach some functionality to it. And uh, let me define an object that I'm going to call social network which will be the scope in which I'm going to define these additional types. So the social network will be basically the domain where I'm going to store my data types. And uh, this is standard practice. We tend to define our data structures inside some sort of object that will uh, encompass the domain uh, of those data structures. And I'm going to define a type name equals string. So this is a type alias, but I'm going to prefix it with the modifier opaque. So opaque is a new modifier in Scala 3. And um, this works as follows. We have just defined a type alias, 
So basically name is a string, which you can now freely use interchangeably. So you can use a name or string inside this domain object here. But the benefit of an opaque type is that we can treat this new type like a standalone type, such as a class or a trait. Let me give an example. So if outside the social network object, I define a value called, let's, let's call this name as a name, and uh, this name type should be from the social network type. So I'm going to comment out my previous definition, and I'm going to import social network everything. All right, so now I have access to this name type. And if on the right hand side, I put in a string like Daniel, I can't even spell my name properly. Uh, this is a compiler error because on the right side, we have a string. And on the left side, we have a name. Now, the reason why this is a compiler error is because this name type is opaque. Opaque means that outside the scope in which it's defined, name and string have zero connection to one another. So outside the scope, name is not equal to string in what concerns the compiler. So an opaque type is implemented as a string, but outside it has nothing to do with the string type. So you cannot use these two types interchangeably. So this is a standalone type, which is implemented as a string. So name is a string with zero overhead. It doesn't wrap a string. It doesn't contain a string. It doesn't use additional strings. So you don't have any overhead. So inside you can use this name as being a string, but outside you will only have access to the dedicated API of this new type. And the dedicated API of this new type is at this moment zero because we have not defined any methods or fields of this name type. All right. So an opaque type is a new type, which is implemented as whatever we decide to use inside the scope in which it's defined. But outside, we can only have access to its own API. So we don't have access to the string API. So how do we define a proper API for this new type name? Well, we have two avenues for this. One of the avenues is through a companion object. And uh, because you've defined this type alias as opaque, it's treated as a standalone type which can also have its companion object, unlike a regular type alias. So you can define an object called name. And here you can define fields and methods that are quote unquote static as you would on a normal class or a trait. So for example, let me define, let's call this def from string. And uh, this will return, for example, an option name, depending on whether this string starts with an uppercase character or not. Remember, we wanted this name to always start with an uppercase character to uh, enforce some logic at runtime. So I'm going to say, if s is empty, or s car at zero is lower, then I'm going to return none, else I'm going to return some s. So this is a simplified implementation, but I'm pretty sure you get the idea. So now this name type has this from string method that you can use right now. And um, at the, uh, let's say in main, if you want to use this type alias here, I can do, for example, uh, let's say val name option as name dot from string and let's say Daniel, and this is some Daniel, some Daniel with quotes, except this string is not treated as a string, but it's treated as a name. And uh, if I wanted to say name option dot for each print line, that is possible. So print line is applied to the value uh, contained in this option. So let me go ahead and comment out this line because this will not compile. And if I wanted to run this application, I will be uh, seeing Daniel here in the console. That is because the option does contain a value. But if you wanted to say name option 
dot map and then you would want to call a method on the underlying value underscore dot um, the compiler is currently showing you the methods from from the class string so for example car at zero however once you write it like that car at is not applicable to the name type so uh, this is something that IntelliJ IDEA and uh, the other IDEs for Scala will have to fix by the time Scala 3 is out. But the, the point is that you cannot call any methods on values of type name. All right. And um, the second avenue through which you can define a proper API for this particular type, for this opaque type, is through extension methods. This is the only way possible that you can add methods to this new type through extension methods. I'm going to talk about extension methods in another video in Scala 3 because this is a new structure of defining extension methods. We aren't using implicit classes anymore. So we're going to use extension. And um, this extension is applied to a name that we call n. So given a name that we called n, I'm going to define the uh, following methods. For example, I'm going to define a method called length, which is the length of the string. And uh, this returns an int. And because I'm defining this extension in the scope in which the opaque type was defined, I can use name and string interchangeably. And that is n.length. So this is possible. I can call the length method on the string class. But the length method that I've defined here in this scope is extended to the name type. So if, for example, I'm going to define, let's call this Daniel's name length option. It's quite a mouthful. Um, I'm going to say name option map underscore length. This is now possible because length is a method on the name type given by this extension data structure. And if I do Daniel's name length option for each print line, I should be seeing the number of characters in my name, which is six. All right, so you see this in the console. So these are the only two ways by which you can attach an API to an opaque type. There is uh, bad news and good news uh, with this new structure. And the bad news is that you basically lose the entire API of the type in terms of which your opaque type is defined. So you lose the entire API of string. This is the bad thing. However, the good news is that you now have a fresh plate. So this is a new type on which you can define a completely new API from scratch. So this is one of the major changes related to opaque types. This is how you can define them. This is how you can use them. And this is how you can define proper APIs for these new opaque types. I want to show you something else. And that is the fact that because this opaque type is still a type alias, if you remember from the previous Scala versions, you can define uh, type aliases that had bounds. And opaque types also support type restrictions or type bounds. And uh, uh, let's imagine we're working on a graphics library this time around. And uh, let's assume we deal with colors in hex. So I'm going to use another object that I'm going to call graphics, just to uh, delimit the scope of this new example. And I'm going to define an opaque type that I'm going to call color. And I'm going to represent this color as an int. So a color is basically an int, but the outside world has no connection or has no knowledge that this color type is implemented as an int. So this is basically an int in hex. And I'm also going to define an opaque type. I'm going to name this color filter, which extends color. So this is a type restriction or a type bound. And on the right hand side, I'm also going to use an int. So this color filter type is a subtype of color and it's implemented as an int as well. Now inside this graphics object, which denotes my mini graphics library, I'm going to define some values. I'm going to define a val called red, which is of type color. And on the right hand side, I'm going to use the hex notation. And there are various ways of encoding this color as uh, hex. I'm going to use 
FF for the red channel, 00 for green, 00 for blue, and 00 for transparency, so zero transparency. I'm going to define a green color as 0x, and then I'm going to write some optional leading zeros for the red channel, but you can omit those. I'm going to use FF for the green channel, 00 for blue, and 00 for transparency, and I'm going to use an additional blue color as 0x, two zeros, that is for red and green, then an FF for the blue channel, and 00 for transparency. And I'm also going to use half transparency, which is a color filter, and I'm going to use 0x88. So this is a 50% transparency. So let's assume we have a graphics library with just three colors. This is really complex. And uh, a half transparency value here of type color filter. Now, we can use color and color filter in the same style as a class hierarchy. And what concerns the possible substitution? So you can define a value of type color and then on the right hand side use a color filter. And I'm going to say import graphics underscore so that we can use the opaque types inside. And I'm going to define a case class. Let's call this overlay. Let's call this overlay filter with a color. Now, if you are to instantiate one of these case classes, uh, because this uh, value over here, this field is of type color, you can also use the color filter um, type. So you can say fade layer as overlay with half transparency. So this works in the same style as a regular class hierarchy. Assume your color was a class and then your half transparency was an instance of a derived class, well, this works in the exact same way. That is because color filter extends color. So this is it, folks. You've learned a new tool in the Scala 3 arsenal. It certainly has its drawbacks and notably the inability to use the API of the underlying type outside the definition of the type alias, but it allows much more flexibility in what you can express in terms of existing types with zero overhead. So for example, this name type has a new API from scratch and it's implemented as a string with exactly zero overhead without needing to wrap a string or assert strings or contain any other strings that you can then access and then modify. All right, so uh, this is pretty powerful. So I hope this video was useful, in which case I'm going to ask you to click the like button for me and subscribe. It helps me a lot and uh, it also gives you the chance to be the first to see upcoming videos that I'm going to share here on the YouTube channel. I'm barely getting started. And in the meantime, leave your feedback in the comments below. I read every single one and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We share fresh updates regularly. Now also check out the Rock the JVM website. We have tons of material like this. And uh, until the next video, I'm Daniel, signing off.